Hello, everybody. Here's the final update of the global research stream. As you know, this stream is quite big. So this year, I didn't want to focus only on the updates of this year. But what I will do is I will show you um, what we had when we started and what is the evolution of this stream. So the overall goal of the global research stream is to use different types of model to understand the effects of mental and lithosphere deformation on basing evolution dynamics. To do that, we have a very big and diverse group with different components. So we have the landscape evolution part, virtual planet parts, and thermomechanical model part. So we have different permanent researchers working there, Tristan Sand with Badlands, Dietmar and Maria with G plates, Patrice and Louis with Underworld. Then we have more technician or developer staff, should I say, with Roman, Julian, and John. We also have a lot of postdocs, even more PhD students, and also external researchers. So of course, all these researchers produced a huge quantity of paper. And usually I present you the different updates on the different sub projects. So the global research stream is divided into five different projects. So this year, I will not do that. I will maybe more focus on all the advances that we made by using the different codes or the different techniques that we developed here. So let's start with the virtual Earth components and the reconstruction model. So let's start with some regional reconstructions. So here you have an example of different refinement which has been done by Simon, Carmen and Ozer in 2018. You have, for example, the refinement of the, of the Australian Antarctica breakup you have the northern ends um, refinement too, and the kinematic and geodynamic evolution of the Panama Isthmus region. Now, the last update on the regional reconstruction is what Gensti have done with Sabine. So here, they propose a deforming plate tectonic model of the South China block since the Jurassic. So Gensti and collaborators found that the South China block experienced significant shortening between 160 million years and 136 million years, followed by an episode of extension from 136 million years to present. They also showed that the deformation is closely related to the subduction of the Oceanic and Pacific plate. The 170 to 136 million year shortening was likely induced by trench advance, and the following extension was mostly driven by subduction retreats. So we have these types of regional reconstruction, but one of the big components is also the deep time reconstruction that Andrew has done in association with Alex Young. What Andrew has done is a global reconstruction of the Neoproterozoic. So he presented this paper here in 2017, and then he refined a reconstruction for the Paleozoic, so 410 to 250 million years, with a focus on North America and China region. What Andrew has done now, at the end of the BGH, is to combine all this reconstruction and extend the full plate tectonic model into deep time. As you know, we are now able to couple plate motion, dynamic topography, tectonics, and landscape evolution model. So this work opened the way of deep time landscape evolution model. In terms of global reconstruction, one of the main advance which has been done during these five years of BGH is uh, the first global tectonic reconstruction incorporating lithospheric deformation that Dietmar published in 2019. This work is refined constantly by people like Sabine and other people in the group. So it's opened the way to new models now because as I told you before, we can couple the plate tectonic with landscape evolution model, which means that we can now 
derive the deformation, lithospheric deformation, and convert that into elevation in our landscape evolution model. The creation of paleoenvironment models has also been done during these five years of PGA. So here you have a new global paleogeography model proposed by Wen Chao Chao, uh, 2018. This work and work like the sediment models proposed by Adriana and Dietmar here, where you have a predicting sediment thickness map for the last, since 200 million years, can also be incorporated and have a huge values of the model. In terms of sediments model, we also have the updates to Kubernetes platform database with the work of Sabine and Adriana in collaboration with the DCO, the Deep Carbon Observatory. So in the virtual planet area, we have the reconstruction, but we also have dynamic topography. So the first thing I would like to say on dynamic topography is I really would like to thank Sabine, because even if you can't really see that in the publication, Sabine is working really, really hard to constrain and refine this mental convection model and create the best trilogy in order to match the first dynamic topography. So thank you very much, Sabine, because your work is a real key component on a lot of projects that we are doing in the global research stream. So now in terms of more focused work, we had the work of Mylis Arno in 2018, where she found that there are different dynamic topography scales. So you have large scale flow in the mantle, which is induced by large plates and lower mantle convective cells. You have intermediate scale from the flow in the upper mantle around the subduction zones, which depend on the slab geometry. And you also have small scale convection below oceanic and continental lithosphere. We also have more regional focused dynamic topographic project with the work of Alex Young and Nicola Fennon. Here, they use global mantle flow model constrained by plate motion to assess the effect of mantle flow and the tectonic subsidence of the copper canning and sulfur carnivore basins. So they show that the mantle upwelling here in warm color contributing to the Triassic Jurassic uplift. So you have the gold profile here, which is a dynamic topography, and the black profile is zero. The uplift of the canning basin and the southern carnivore basin. They also showed that the plate motion away from the upwelling caused the subsidence of the canning and southern Canavan basin. They also showed that the thinking of the early Cambrian slam caused dynamic uplift in the copper basin right by the Permian and Conformity. So the last word for curious on dynamic topography is what Chengchi has done here. So you have a couple evolution of plate tectonic and basal mantle structure from 1 billion years ago to the present. This video here illustrates how changing plate tectonic configuration affect the deep mantle convection and cause basal mantle structure to deform and migrate through time. Okay, so now in terms of virtual planet, we talked about dynamic topography, but let's focus a little bit more on mantle plumes. And it starts with the work of Rakim Asad. So he showed that the Pacific LLSVP deform asymmetrically between 100 million years ago and 50 million years ago. And that the predicted hotspot tracks explain the formation of the sharp Hawaiian Umper, Umper bed bands that you can see here without requiring a ma major change in plate motion. This work has been followed by the work of Nick Barnett Moore, who also worked with Rakim Hassan, and they proposed a new model for the Iceland plume. So they integrated mantle prediction model and published constraint. So they show that the widespread Paleocene and early Eocene uprift across the region can be explained by mantle driven effects of a large plume around 2050 kilometer in diameter. You will see that this model is now used by our honor students. Rakib in 2020 
continue his work on mantle plume and proposed a new dynamic topography model for the East African Rift. This model is also used now in an honors project. Another work on mantle plumes has been published by Maylis in 2020. And she discovered that you have different types of plume in the mantle. You have stable plumes, slow drifting plumes, path drifting plumes. She made a lot of statistical analysis to determine when we have fixed plume, where they are located, etc., etc. And the last work we have on mantle plume is the work of Genchi. Genchi look at the evolution of mantle plumes and LLSVP. So the question he wanted to answer are, do plumes occur prefer preferentially at LLSVP margins and are the LLSVP st stable and rigid through time? And here's what they found. The plume development preferentially occur along the edges of the LLSVPP, as you can see here, and can migrate toward the interior of the basalt structure over time when they interact with slabs. They also showed that you have one plume here, which can also form away from the thermochemical structures and are often within a small network of sinking slabs. Now, the second component of this global research stream is all the research we've done about lithospheric deformation with UW geodynamics. So we have an example of the work that Omer Bodur did and how you can study dynamic topography using these thermomechanical models. So he showed that the tilting of plate can be driven by horizontal motion relative to the asthenosphere. He also worked on the impact of non-Newtonal rheology on dynamic topography. And he's now investigating the meteor cell tinting of Australia driven by basal shear with Patrice Ray, of course, and Gregory Hausman. Big advances in terms of extension models have been done by Luke Mundy. Here, he looked at the influence in sedimentation on the deformation during a rifting event. So he showed that the loading due to the growing sediment pile mitigate crystal thinning and delay the exhumation of the lithosphere. He also did a suite of experiments with different extensional velocities set at one, two, and four centimeters per year. And in the experiment shown on the left, the extensional velocity is two centimeters per year. So for each velocity, they stop the sedimentation when the distance between the rigid conjugated margin which is 30, 60, 80, and 100 kilometers. On this model here, they stopped the sedimentation when the distance was 80 kilometers. So they showed that the average depth of drift basin through time showed the sharp depth inversion that is triggered by the cessation of sedimentation. This depth inversion is also associated to a stress inversion. We also have convergence model with the work that Andres has done and uh, that I presented uh, last year. So it will present the new research he's doing in the global research stream session. And now we have the third component of the global research stream is the surface processes. So I go quickly on the first parameters part with the backtracking tool that Dietmar developed here, which allowed to reconstruct the paleobathymetry on oceanic and continent crust. We also have the new, new sea level curve that Sabins and different research assistants designed through time, which has been used in all the studies, the Badland studies that you will see. So now we can focus on the modeling part. So I'm sorry, I will not detail what the Gallagher's team has done on the East Asian monsoon mystery, for example. I will more focus on the Badlands model. So we have the work that Mendy has done on the carbonate platform impact. Mendy will also give a talk, so she might uh, talk about that again. So very quickly, she showed how carbon platforms can alter seascapes in ways that are traditionally less understood. 
Now we also have the work of Christian Ding, which investigated the impact of dynamic topography here, a dynamic topography uplift on the sedimentation of a continental margin. So I really would like to focus on that for a minute and say that Christian developed more quantitative analysis of these models. And so thank you, Christian. Thank you a lot because a lot of people are using your technique here to extract the stratigraphy and the Wheeler diagram. Okay, so here's what I showed you. Different researchers working on different subjects using different codes, etc. One of the goal of the global research stream is to be able to use coupled information, coupled models. And this is exactly what we try to achieve. So here is what we wanted to do at the beginning. So coupled G plates so reconstruction model with thermomechanical model with surface processes model and stratigraphy models. So doing these types of work. With, we're working with different skills, so different technology here, badlands, on the world, G plates, seed currents. Different scales means also different grids. So this explains why it's not so simple. We need to deal with different time and spatial scales, which means that we have different motion, different rology, grain size, types of material that we need to take into account. But here is the next advantage in terms of coupled model. The first coupled models we have done is the thermomechanical model. We coupled surface processes here with badlands and lithospheric deformation here with UWG elements. So Roman already explained to you why it's really important to be able to take these two scales into account. Because when you have erosion deposition, so here with the badlands model, these you have gravity stress associated with that erosion height and area, so which play a huge role on tectonic. And the tectonic here, of course, impact relief, phase inside, erodibility, etc. etc. So these phenomena are linked. So when we started the global research stream, here's what we had: the work of Roman Boshi here with 2.5D rift model, which means a 2D underwater model here and a 3D badlands model at the top. And thanks to Xuishan work, we were able to extract some padding pattern, wheeler diagram and bore hold. Oh, sorry, Roman here. And so then when I arrived, we started still with Roman to work on 3D oblique rift model. And here's what we have. The, you have the oblique rift, you have the badlands area, and you have two cross sections on both margin where you have the sedimentation evolving through time. At this time, we faced a lot of different issues. So for example, we started to apprehend the boundary condition of our model. And now we have these types of model, more extend, high resolution model, when we can also look at the obliquity of the rift and how the sedimentation differ before the breakup, during the breakup, after the breakup, depending on the obliquity of the rift. What we also have is pull up our basing. So here you have the work that Patrice, Tristan, and Luke Ardiman started with, oh, you can't see the movie, with Underworld 1. And here is what we have now with Underworld 2. You have a model here of Patrice, and here you have a model of Roman that you can see on the UW Geodynamics Reaper Dock. We also have compression model with this model here, which he's done, oh, doesn't work, oh yeah, um, which has been done by a student in collaboration with Roman Boshi. And we have a band, a range of continental margin model so here I looked at the influence of the sedimentation on the propagation of the deformation. And I found that the topography and the load of sediments allow the localization of the deformation on the margin, but it also induces different timing of both migration. So when you have sediments, you have smaller slopes and the migration is slowest. 
So this couple model really opened the way of a bunch of different studies. So here you have continental on margin model, you have 10 centimeter, two centimeter per year of extension, one centimeter of extension, you can test the influence of extension rate on the sedimentation, for example. You can also, this is the top part of a coupled model, you can look at the influence of the sea level on the sedimentation and the deformation on the margin. Here you have a model with a sea level curve, and here you have a model with a fixed sea level. Now, we also design another coupling, which is a one-way coupling this time. This coupling is between mantle convection model, like this one, and surface processes model values. So when you couple tectonic reconstruction model with mantle convection model, you can extract dynamic topography, and you can apply that on surface evolution model. This allowed to investigate the effect of deep mantle flow, a static sea level, but also climate, etc., on the evolution of drainage and deposition of patterns of any basins around the world. So in terms of workflow, here is the evolution of the balance model since the beginning of the BGH. So it started in 2016, when you can see here the first Papua New Guinea model. In 2017, 18, here is the new um, PNG model. So you can see that it's way more realistic. Sorry, the movie didn't work. We also had uh, the continental scale model here of Australia done by Tristan Sack. And what we have done in 2019 is to incorporate the horizontal velocity with the work of Kian. And we are now able to see carbonate and plastic sediment in the stratigraphy. And here's what we have done in 2020. So we designed a workflow named PaleoFlow which allow us to incorporate horizontal displacement, tectonic, dynamic topography, climate, et cetera, et cetera, in the landscape evolution model. In terms of model, Kian will show what he has done on the north slope of Alaska during the Papua New Guinea session. I also work on the Orange Basin in South Africa, when I try to understand the impact of dynamic topography on the sedimentation of the Orange Basin. Su Chan worked on the Norwegian margin with the Equinor team, so I really would like to thank them because they really brought all their knowledge on this margin and we were able to constrain the model thanks to their inputs. So she looked at the plume and tectonic influence on the sedimentation along the Norwegian margin. Chris Alfonso worked on the Nile River evolution through time so we worked with Chevron for this project. Chris looked at the influence of mantle plume, subduction, tectonics, and climate change on the evolution of, on the, of the Nile River system. And it will present you that in the global research train session. Okay, so don't worry, this is almost the end. So global stream statement. Now, what we plan to do was this five different sub projects. What we have done is we completed this project. Sometimes we changed a little bit of the name and refined a little bit what was inside, but we can say that we take all the buffs and we also have a cherry on the cake here because the sub project five was the application of 3D coupled model of, on different tectonic settings. But this coupled model was between underworld and bad news. And what we have done this year is to couple, it's a one-way coupling, but you saw that we work on Norwegian margin, Nile River, um, Orange Basin, et cetera, when we coupled SIGCOMS model and landscape evolution model bad news. So what we delivered through this five project, we developed dynamic model and quantified the effect of dynamic topography, tectonic climate, sea level variation, and basin evolution. But this is just the start because now you can reuse this model and apply them to various of cases. So the last point is here is what we plan to do. And this is not possible. 
But what we have done, we improved and add the new G plate model. We improved the geodynamic model linking reconstruction of the surface of the hearse and the mantle dynamic. We also did a coupling, which include the upper mantle, lithosphere dynamics, and surface processes. And another one, which include deep mantle dynamic, tectonic, sea level, climate, and surface evolution. So we delivered a lot of different models, but we also delivered two different coupled models. To finish, I really would like to thank the NCI because without the calculation time that we have been allocated, we couldn't have done one third of what I showed you. And now this is my thank you dance. So I would like to take the opportunity I have now to thank the industry partner, the Equinor researcher really helped us to constrain our model as well as the Chevron researcher. Um, I really would like to contribute all the global research stream researcher especially the ones who answered my email. So thank you. I would like to acknowledge the students who did an excellent work and pushed us to develop this workflow. And big thanks to all these research assistants, the sea level curves, et cetera, that you designed. We used it all the time. Um, talking about workflow, I also would like to thank the developers because without them, all the work I showed you wouldn't have been possible. So they did an amazing job to build codes and workflow for others. This is very time consuming and sometimes it's not very rewarding, but not today. So special thanks to Roman, to Julian, and to, to um, John Kana, Michael Chin too. Um, and of course, a big thanks to Tristan, which has been very, very available and huge and, and helped a lot of people in this stream. And I would like to thank Dietmar for the opportunity of leading this uh, global stream. So if you have questions, don't hesitate.